My question is about the uh, relevance of the animal studies. What's the predict what is the predictive quality of the animal studies when you compare it to humans? When you do these studies on pigs, if you do the studies on rats or Chinese hamster ovaries, what is the, what is the nexus that it's actually relevant to humans? Well, of course, we were looking for a mechanism of interaction. And the mechanism of interaction is, it has to be at the cellular level if there is one. So, it's much easier to study things at the cellular level than get human volunteers and expose them and look what happens to them. Now, they do expose animals, and of course what they try and do is use animals that are as close as possible to humans. So they've done a lot of experiments on monkeys to look at what the exposure limits are that they can tolerate and what happens to them. And to some extent, that's how they found out what level of heating is uncomfortable for an animal, which has allowed them to at least set a standard somewhere to make sure that cell phones are not microwave ovens. You know, so you do the best you can, but I think the single most important fact, you know, which I think convinces me, is there's no increase of brain tumors on the planet. And if cell phones cause brain tumors, which is what most people think is the greatest risk, you should be seeing something. I mean, you're not going to be able to find people who don't use a cell phone before too long. You know, I know that. Well, here's the fact. There's, Scandinavians have been using cell phones for 20 odd years now, and there's still nothing showing up in terms of increased cancer. Now, they've, a, they've actually been using early on much more powerful phones that were not smart, that irradiated them a lot more. But of course, there's no answer to that. If you say, well, we've not seen effects because we haven't waited long enough, I won't be able to answer that until people have been using cell phones for 100 years. And there's nobody alive, you know, who hasn't been using a cell phone for 100 years. But the preponderance of the evidence and the fact that these tumors are not increasing, and there's no mechanism in my judgment as a scientist, you know, tells me that it's irrational to worry about something that's just not there. Uh, just to follow up to my question, uh, because we can't get human volunteers, probably, and we can't stick probes in, the, in their heads, couldn't we use cadavers? Wouldn't a human cadaver give a better... They've actually used cadavers to, to learn what the properties of the head are. Um, we use pigs, but we've measured all the electrical properties of the head. So at least we can contribute to the people who do the modeling that tells them how much energy actually does penetrate how far and how much heating do you get at certain depths within the brain. And this is all very, very well documented. Okay? I want to come back to one study that the gentleman at the back mentioned. There is this man called Henry Lai at the University of Washington, who I know well, who claims to see effects on the brains of rats. Nobody who has attempted to repeat his experiments can get the same results. Many people have tried. He's a singular guy who claims he gets these effects. I'm not a biologist, so I'm not sure what he's doing wrong. But in my opinion, he's probably making some mistake in his protocol. But the fact that nobody can replicate his finding, and there have been many attempts makes me suspicious. And I know it's easy to criticize studies funded by the industry. But the fact is, I know the people in the industry. The last thing they want to do is sell a product that really is dangerous and have billion dollar lawsuits make them bankrupt. So they've always monitored this health issue very, very carefully. And that's why they funded these studies. They funded people who were famous for always getting positive results. And quite often, they fund these people and they get negative results. So I don't think it's fair to say just because a study is funded by the industry, it's inherently wrong because I'd like to think that most scientists have scientific integrity. And most of the time, if you get money from somebody, the conditions you take it under are that you are free and clear to do the experiments and to report the results as you find them. You're not in the pocket of the industry to report just the results that they like. Yeah. I had a couple of questions. One is um, there could be complicating factors by trends of people wearing um, the uh, Bluetooth earpiece or uh, using speakerphone. In other words, they're cell phone users, but they don't have the RF uh, very close to them. 
um, I, I don't have concerns about RF, but I do just out of um, personal preference like to use the speaker phone. It just seems more comfortable on walking around if the environment uh, is socially acceptable. Um, I was just wondering, isn't it possible that could um, complicate um, a search for trends of increasing brain cancers? In other words, people are using cell phones more widely, but they're using the earpiece or as a speaker phone or something like that. Well, the Bluetooth, of course, is another radio frequency communication technology that runs at much lower power than the cell phone because it's only got to talk from your phone up to the thing that's stuck in your ear. So it's a very, very low power. So I would say that if the cell phone in your ear is not a problem, and I believe it is not because there's no evidence, the Bluetooth device should not be either. And of course, some of the people who want to prove that there's a health problem, they've actually complained to people doing studies. We can't find if there's a health problem because you keep changing the technology. They want us to use phones that were built 20 years ago and have everybody use those same phones for 50 years to see if there's a problem. And they're claiming that we're trying to cover up something because we make better phones that use less energy and use new protocols. You know, well, there's no answer to that. Yeah, I guess that was a, a re I wasn't aware of that, and that's a rephrasing of what my question was, and I guess that addressed it. My other question, um, Oh my gosh, I must have held the phone too close to my head. It seems to have slipped my mind. Please uh, go on to the next person. Yeah. Okay. From a physics standpoint, can you compare? I, I had a fall years back, and I got both a CAT scan with contrast of my head, and then later an MRI of my skull. And I had a feeling that, you know, I can worry about these levels that don't seem capable of doing anything. <coughs> And yet my doctor seemed to think that the risk assessment was pretty good for doing all of that. Uh, I also wonder about all the security apparatus that we go through, not just in the stores, but to get on an airplane or these places like this. Um, are any of those things, uh, how, how would you compare them or put them into context as our risk? Well, you know, CAT scans, of course, use ionizing radiation. They use x-rays. And in fact, there's been a recent concern that some machines and some people who operate them have been running them at higher exposure levels and are safe. So some people have been overexposed to ionizing radiation from CAT scans. So they do suffer a potential health risk because of that exposure. Magnetic resonance imaging machines have also been studied there's no evidence of any health consequences from people who've had MRIs. But MRI machines actually also expose you to radio frequencies. People don't actually believe that the magnetic field itself is a problem, but there's a radio frequency field as well that lets you do the imaging. But as I say, even though those fields are quite strong, I think the risk-benefit analysis is so much in favor of using them when designated that people have not been greatly concerned about them. As far as security systems are concerned, there's two new security systems coming online right now. Millimeter wave scanners, which are non-ionizing images, and low-dose backscatter X-ray devices. My personal opinion is that the millimeter wave devices, because they're non-ionizing radiation, are not a risk. For much the same reason I don't believe cell phones are a risk. They do operate at higher frequencies. I think the power levels are very low. On the other hand, the backscattered X-ray systems do expose you to a very low level of X-rays. So there is a small additional risk. However, it's been pointed out by people that if you fly on a transcontinental flight, you get as much exposure from increased cosmic ray activity at 30 odd thousand feet as you would get going through one of these backscatter X-ray machines. My opinion is, if I have to get a, go through a backscattered x-ray machine, I'd be inclined to say, I don't want to do it. I want a hand examination. But if it was a millimeter wave device, I'd be quite comfortable going through it because it's non-ionizing. How can you tell which is which? Well, you have to ask. You have to ask yeah, I don't think you can always tell. Ionizing? Yeah, the backscatter is ionizing radiation. Oh, okay. And the millimeter wave is not. So I would worry less about the millimeter wave ones. Even the backscattered x-ray ones, the risk is tiny. Yeah. 
but there is a little bit of risk. Yeah. So I think that's a choice anybody has to make. And I think to find out which one they're using, you'd need to ask. I've never actually been confronted with the backscatter x-ray one. I did go through one millimeter wave scanner, but not here in the States, it was in Europe. And the risk is cumulative. I'm sorry? The risk is cumulative for ionizing radiation. That's true. But of course, that's also true. I don't know whether airline pilots who are constantly at 35,000 feet actually do have a significantly elevated cancer risk because they certainly get much more cosmic ray exposure. And I don't know what the, the answer to that question, but you are quite correct. Yes. First one comment, and I don't know if my cell phone had a warning to keep it two millimeters or two centimeters from my head. Um, it may have because everything comes with pages and pages of warnings now. Uh, but just from personal experience, um, I've talked on my cell phone for half an hour, 40 minutes, and it gets hot. And that's a, oh, yeah. a potential for actually burning the skin, not from you know, that. And, I mean, and yeah, that's just a side right. point. And then the question I have is um, the, the radiation for communications from cell phone, is that very, is that different from the radiation communicating a Wi-Fi computer internet connection like I'm using now? Different frequencies. That's real. I mean, different frequencies, different communication protocols. Wi-Fi, I think you're talking about lower power levels. Because your cell phone typically has enough output in principle to go maybe more than a kilometer if you're far from the base station. And all today's phones are smart. They automatically use the lowest power that they need to talk to the base station. So if you're close to the base station, your cell phone has actually reduced its transmit power. And you would only see the cell phone transmitting at its max if you were far from a base station. That was the only one that you could connect to. Now, to come back, cell phones get hot because they are electrically inefficient. The battery in the phone doesn't convert all its energy into the RF. It dumps a lot of it just into heating. And there have been instances some people can get face neuralgia because the phone actually can heat your cheek about four degrees. But that's not from the radiation. It's because the phone is just getting warm because it's not an efficient electrical device. I work in a place where I don't have bars. Um, what's my cell phone doing? Is it trying harder? And, and yeah, is it yes. <laughs> it's trying to work at maximum power to find a connection for you. Um, I don't think I'm going to get pelvic uh, impairment from this, <laughs> but. Um, it, I guess my battery gets burned down. It'll run your battery down faster, absolutely. And again, it's non-ionizing radiation. The levels are really low. And I think, given all the things we should be worrying about in society, we shouldn't be worrying about this. The danger is, if you start worrying about it, and this happens, our politicians hear from constituents who are worried. They then want to throw money at this problem, and they're not going to find anything, but they feel good because they're wasting millions of dollars. Now, in the States, they're not doing it much. You can't get funding for this kind of research, for example, from the National Institutes of Health. They're not interested. But the Europeans are still putting some money into this. Okay? That's why I said at the beginning of my talk, I do this somewhat as a scientific sideline because it's interesting, not because I'm expecting to get lots of research funding in the future. I, do it, I get that for doing other things. I'd like to suggest, first of all, thanks. Uh,